I would like to welcome Mike Jones from Museums Victoria and the University of Melbourne, who will present his work from his PhD, also submitted in August. If only you could see what I've seen with your eyes, the accumulation of collections-based knowledge. Thank you, Mike. I'm just going to set a timer so I don't run over because I have a tendency to keep talking. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this has some uh, possibly interesting connections to the previous two papers, so I'm really happy to be speaking in this session. And the quote uh, that forms the title of this presentation, some of you may recognize, and given the conference theme, uh, comes from a scene in Blade Runner where uh, Batty is speaking with the man who literally created the eyes that went into his head uh, and says to him, if only you could see what I've seen with your eyes. Uh, and it's a really interesting kind of uh, moment when we're thinking about some of the things, for example, that Belinda was talking about with the sort of embodiment of memory and the difficulty of transferring those sort of experiences potentially when you weren't in those situations yourself. Uh, and some of that relates to notions of memory and experience uh, and the sort of knowledge that we try and pass on to other people. And keeping the sci-fi theme going for just a sec, uh, there's the interesting kind of mom uh, interesting characters in Star Trek with the Borg and the idea of the kind of collective mind and the hive mind and those experiences being transferred between people, which is not something that we can necessarily manage in our own work. So my work is around, uh, and my PhD was about archives in museums and looking at museums as particular spaces where the archives uh, form a function of documenting some of the knowledge in those institutions and some of the knowledge about collections, but in some cases have been separated off into their own spaces, their own systems, documented with their own standards. And there are these notions, uh, this quote from Alan Bain, that uh, if museums are where the muses live, museum archives are where they remember this notion of archives as kind of collective memory, but there are some problematic aspects to that in these sorts of spaces where these things are documented in kind of uh, regimented archival and record keeping uh, regimes. So here's an archive in a museum, it's the Victoria and Albert Museum archives in uh, Blythe House in London. I think since I was there, it may have been moved into a different space uh, because it was about to be, be moved along. But this is a kind of modern museum archive. It looks like an archive that I'm sure uh, many people, if not everyone in this room, is quite familiar with. And it's in a separate building to the rest of the collections. It's managed within its own kind of department and section. It has its own documentation systems. And some of this can be traced back to some of the events early in the, earlier in the 20th century. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but there's some really interesting periods of kind of professionalization and professional separa separation that occurs where archivists and the emerging archival community started to pay attention to spaces like museums, started to think, well, uh, archives are not being documented and managed as archives in these institutions, therefore we need to start paying more attention to these things. Uh, this quote here is from a conference on museum archives that was held in the late 1970s, uh, and what came out of that in terms of guidelines were that, for example, the archives should be an entity within the museum administrative structure where practical, it should be a separate department. There's lots of discussion about having their sort of autonomous collecting regimes. And the location and physical conditions of the archival repository, they should be located in a separate and secure area of the museum with adequate protections, et cetera. Uh, but in many cases, this was uh, the effect of some of these sort of guidelines was archivists going into museums or being employed in museums to start a museum archives and extracting many of these documents out of their current context and documenting them as, if you like, separate archival collections. And that resulted in some interesting kind of ruptures in the sort of knowledge that was contained in these institutions, as well as having some significant benefits of making material more discoverable, more accessible, etc. cetera. Uh, many of you may be familiar with these systems. One of the other sort of aspect of this is a technology aspect where archival technologies in some cases had kind of parallel but separate development from museums technologies. 
and some of this has been driven, or some of this separation has been driven by that technology story. Uh, EMU being one example, so EMU was implemented at Museums Victoria, uh, and they were one of the first institutions that developed that as a system. The development sort of process started in 1996, 1997. When that happened, Museums Victoria didn't have a professional dedicated archivist on staff. The first one was employed in 1998, and the archives program was started in 1999. It meant that EMU was developed without an archives module, so when the archivists came on board, they needed to implement a separate system to implement archival standards and do records management. Uh, and so TRIM, or HP Records Manager, or whatever it was called at that time, was implemented at that point. The archives module came into EMU in the 2000s, but by that point the investment had already been made in TRIM, so the documentation was never transferred across, and there's this big split that exists between those sorts of collections and the knowledge about them in the institution. And we can see this, uh, for example, in museum websites and search uh, interfaces where we can see research catalogues for museum collections, libraries and archives in separate catalogues, uh, the Victoria and Albert, you can search the collections or did you mean search the archives, uh, same at the American Museum of Natural History, etc., etc. Uh, I can show many examples of this. And one of the interesting effects of this and something that people working in the conservation area have been talking about for a while is the issue of dissociation. And this is an issue where uh, sort of documentation that you need to understand a collection gets separated from those collections uh, and reduces the value of the collection, reduces the knowledge that we have about it. Uh, and in preventative conservation, there's a bunch of other issues that are looked at, and they're all kind of physical issues around things like temperature and humidity and pests and theft and uh, fire, all those sort of elements that can be a threat to collections. But dissociation is seen as a kind of intellectual threat to collections, which is caused by separate sorts of issues and needs to be managed. So here's a description of it by uh, Robert Waller and Paisley Cato. That the object level objects must be identified to enforce a link between the object and its associated data. And that can include acquisition files, catalog files, provenance information, conservation documentation, research files, etc. Uh, field notes is mentioned in there. Uh, and here's an interesting example that I'll get to in just a moment. And ancillary material, etc. Where those sort of separations exist in collection documentation, Quite often that uh, enforced link doesn't exist between those things uh, or isn't documented in a way that can be retrieved and passed on. And returning to the kind of memory theme, which I'll keep on sort of trying to come back to through this, that a lot of that information about those connections between things and where to find that knowledge in those different sorts of areas is in people's heads. It's in the experience of staff. It's in the kind of implicit knowledge that staff have having worked in these spaces for a very long time but there aren't necessarily systems for effectively capturing and maintaining those things in a sustainable, retrievable form of documentation within the institution. So I mentioned field books, uh, just to show some images of these in exhibition spaces uh, and some other projects. This is a display at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, it's a cabinet about some of the early expeditions to the Arctic uh, and some of the first flights over the South Pole and the North Pole. And there's a field book sitting there on an artifact that was part of that sort of exhibition used in conjunction with artifacts and other materials to tell the story of what occurred in this space. And all of these items are sort of dual functioning as evidence and as narrative devices. Uh, here's an example of a field book which is in this case illustrating process, uh, or two field books here, illustrating process and the process of paleontology and talking about how specimens are collected, the sort of field work that occurs. Uh, and some of these have some really interesting kind of other contextual information about people's travels through particular areas, uh, about the expeditions that they went on, about the weather, or about the local culture, etc. And all of this sort of knowledge helps to accumulate information around objects, artifacts, specimens, etc. Uh, that can really contribute to our understanding of these things and our knowledge about them. And there have been some really interesting projects that have started to make these documents or these records more accessible. The things like the Field Book Project uh, in the US, which started at the Smithsonian, involved the American Museum of Natural History. This was about digitizing these items, improving archival description around them, improving the sort of records about them. Uh, some of it was about marking up particular elements of this, marking up things like specimen names so that you could then link these into specimen databases. And this happened in Australia as well. 
Uh, Museums Victoria has been involved in this, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, linking field books through to things like the Atlas of Living Australia. But many of these things continue to enrich the information about individual archival records or small collections of archival records without necessarily also creating those links into other collection spaces or those sort of links that can alleviate these issues of dissociation that exist between these different collection types and these different materials. Just to give an example, I generally try not to put too much text on slides and I've just piled all of this on there because it's actually an interesting example in itself to see the sort of processes that are involved. And this has been slightly de-identified here. Uh, but this is a curator at a major museum talking about the process that they go through when they're trying to find information about particular objects and collections. Uh, they're saying, well, if you know when it, came, when it sort of came in and which part of the archives it might be in, you might need to go to these other archives, the bunker archives. The anthropology department has some separation in some of its archival collections because of when it was established and that sort of history. You need to know the era you're talking about. You need to know who was looking after it to know where it might reside, uh, et cetera. So you have to come from all these different angles. And when asked, do you have systems or indexing or documentation practices that help you kind of capture and manage some of that information more effectively? The answer was, well, not really. You just go off and start digging around. And sometimes you go to a colleague and you say, well, go and ask Frank. Frank knows all about where this stuff is. Um, and they'll be able to help you out with this. Uh, and then you go and ask them. But you need to know the right person to ask. And they need to retrieve it from their memory. And they have all that kind of knowledge embedded. Um, the interesting thing with this is this process happens repeatedly in large institutions and in museums in particular, and I've spoken to many people in this space over the last few years as part of my research, where you know, this is not uncommon and it happens over and over again, potentially for the same records and the same sorts of collections, particularly high demand collections, where if a researcher then comes in six months later and wants to follow some of these same pathways through these different materials and these different elements, they need to go through the same process as this. They need to know who to ask. They need to know the organizational history. They need to know Frank and where to find him if he still works at the institution. And if those things aren't captured effectively when those people retire or move on or move to other places, then a lot of those connections are lost. The records themselves might be maintained effectively. They might be maintained as a well-described set of archival material. The collections may be preserved physically effectively, but the knowledge about them hasn't necessarily been connected up across those sorts of spaces. And some interesting consequences of the way that some of this is treated can be seen in, uh, in projects like the Collection Risk Assessment and Management Project that happened at Museums Victoria. And this was assessing right across the collections issues like dissociation, um, as well as the physical threats to collections, and looking at uh, what the risks were to some of that information being lost. And dissociation was seen as a risk all the way through this. It was identified as one of the significant risks across the humanities collections as well as the scientific collections. But interestingly, because of the way that these institutions are set up and referring back to some of the, that historical separation that exists, the museum archives weren't included in this assessment because they're not part of the state heritage collection. They're not part of the museum collection. They're seen as a kind of separate component for all those kind of reason, historical and professional reasons uh, that sort of led up to that point, which meant that things that had already been separated off from the collection due to historical processes and reasons weren't seen as having become dissociated. It was looking at the current state of things and trying to preserve things as they are, rather than looking at it in this kind of evolutionary context or this, the context of time, essentially. And some of these projects potentially need to actually go the other way and say, well, these things don't seem to have a lot of knowledge associated with them, but is there knowledge that exists somewhere else in the inst institution, a kind of reassociation process, rather than just trying to manage current state of things against increasing dissociation? Otherwise, we're kind of trying to preserve the present without knowing whether the present is the ideal. Some of this ties into kind of knowledge management issues, um, and I know that this sort of knowledge can't be captured in full in these sort of environments. Uh, again, I'm sure that many people in here know the sort of terminology that comes out of these areas, where you get things like tacit knowledge, implicit knowledge, explicit knowledge. 
that you can't capture the total knowledge and experience. You know, it's that embodied kind of moment. You can't fully get someone else to experience what you've seen and what you know and your experience in these spaces. Working in a museum kind of space, some of this knowledge comes from working physically with the artifacts themselves and working with communities and working with other people and their expertise in these spaces. But there are many other elements of this with these relationships that exist sideways between collections or that entangle these collections together that could be much more effectively documented than they are. And not necessarily trying to do all of this in kind of large retrospective documentation projects, but setting up systems and structures where as people use these collections and as people explore these sort of complexities, they can start to connect these things up and capture some of that information uh, back into documentation systems. So a couple of quick examples around this. Uh, again, I won't spend long on these, but one of the really interesting areas to look at with this sort of material uh, is ethnographic collections and anthropological collections. So just to give a couple of examples, this is a mask collected by Alfred Court Haddon in the Torres Strait Islands in the late 19th century. And the collection documentation around this just says something along the lines of uh, it was sort of made on order and it's smaller than the original, and that was about it. Uh, there is one reference to an archival document, uh, and that archival document exists in the archives rather than connected to the museum collection. So this does have a reference but it's a very minimal reference and you still have to go and do the work in the archives yourselves to find out where this sort of came from. Uh, and that document talks about the fact that Jay Bruce, who lived on Murray Island up in the Torres Strait, requested that this be made. Uh, and you can sort of find out that it's probably because an earlier version of this mask was stolen uh, and this was then created on order to replace the item that was stolen. But information around who made it uh, the details around the original mask, its uh, sort of provenance and the stories and narratives around it are in other archival documents that are spread across multiple institutions and through other parts of the collections. And it takes quite a lot of digging to uncover it at the moment. Again, every person who looks at this at the moment needs to go through that same sort of process. Uh, similarly, this very, very famous shield from the British Museum uh, it's been included in a couple of recent exhibitions. Uh, there's some debate about its provenance, but it's believed potentially to be a shield that was used by the uh, men who met Captain Cook and Joseph Banks when they first landed in Botany Bay in 1770. And the documentation around this at the moment has a couple of small references to that, but the majority of the documentation says this is associated with Cook, this is associated with Banks, and doesn't contain any of the community knowledge and the cultural knowledge that's embedded around that and that's accumulated around that over the many decades and centuries since then. And another example, the Donald Thompson collection. Uh, again, this contains a couple of cross-references in this earlier documentation, which is microfiche documentation. But when you look at the collection, and this is one I've looked at in quite a bit of detail. I've also spoken about it before, though, so I won't go into all that detail here. A single item like a, a hunting rope, there's this enormous accumulation of material around it from biological specimens to different archival material to publications to people to communities uh, and community knowledge and all of this sort of complex material embedded around it into this kind of network of associations and very little of that is captured uh, in conjunction with other collection documentation. So, Turning finally to some metaphors around this and for some of the structures around documentation, uh, there are many elements of this that are based on hierarchical structures in existing documentation. This is a kind of old school tree diagram looking at uh, the natural sciences. But we also see this in the sort of taxonomies and the hierarchies that are created for things like uh, social and cultural objects or technology objects. This is a computer that is furnishing an equipment, tools and equipment, and computer, and that's a taxonomy that's being given to it in this kind of hierarchical structure. But this is the computer that Tim Berners-Lee used to create the internet and first put it online, and none of that's captured in the classification systems. Uh, it's mentioned briefly in a description, but all the social, social and cultural knowledge that comes around that and that be, can be connected to that, including in some really significant archival collections and documentary collections and material online, people then have to dig through and find for themselves to piece all of this stuff together. And so if we move away from these notions of hierarchies, uh, 
and something Alfred Kroeber talked about, the fact that even though things like natural sciences, there may be elements of hierarchy in there and these sort of tree-like structures, that in kind of human culture structures and social and cultural structures, there are all these other sorts of intersections and interconnections that also exist. And the metaphor that he suggests is something like a coral reef, uh, which is an interesting way of thinking about documentation and collection structures because there are still hierarchical elements in there and what I'm not arguing here is that we throw out archival hierarchies and archival description and start creating just uh, sort of detailed interconnected networks. It's that we need to incorporate hierarchies with other sorts of structures and other sorts of interconnections and other sorts of relationships to start building kind of more complex ecosystems that connect up these collections in new and interesting ways. And this will have benefits to different sorts of users. Um, continuing the kind of metaphor, people talk about the idea of skimmers, swimmers, and divers to uh, assist different types of users with the levels of knowledge that they're interested in. And some of this sort of complex interconnection and some of these associations that exist with these other areas of knowledge are the sort of things that may only be useful to uh, you know, sections of our communities and our user communities but it doesn't mean that as those things emerge, they don't need to be captured in more effective kind of ways. So returning to this theme of capturing other sorts of knowledge around uh, collection items and around archives, that we're not aiming for the entirety of this, but there are many things that people know working in these spaces that exist in their implicit knowledge at the moment, uh, particularly in long-term staff in institutions like museums, I'm sure in community organizations and other sorts of spaces as well, where those sorts of interconnections that exist outside of these kind of hierarchical structures and outside of these existing catalog structures and that span divisions between professions and disciplines and systems and technologies can start to be captured in more effective and interesting ways so we can start to navigate some of those connections that exist between things more effectively and not have to continually repeat that kind of work and if we do that, then we can prevent the kind of leeching away of some of this knowledge to continue the coral reef theme or to return to the Blade Runner theme. We can prevent these things being lost like tears in rain. Thank you. <laughs>